for joining us tonight. I'm Aaron Castro. I'm joined by Victor Perez and Dan Brown in New York City. Uh, Joshua, another place that's been snowed in, the frozen tundra has refrozen. So hit him up uh, on Twitter at Earful of Dirt. Hashtag EOD pod for questions. Also uh, in the you know in the live chat, if you want live stuff answered, we'll uh, fit it in throughout the show. Today we are joined by the poach himself, Liam Madigan from Poacher Tundra Rugby. Uh, how are you doing tonight, man? Welcome to the show. I'm doing fantastic tonight, Aaron. Thank you guys for having me so much. You know, I've been watching your podcast for the last couple of months now as we were preparing for MLR, and now I'm finally excited to actually uh, be a part of it. And it's Penguin Tundra r- Rugby, by the way, uh, not Poacher Tundra, though. You know, that's my Twitter handle. <laughs> but uh, I'm just ready to talk some rugby. Do you think? Um, do you think we'll actually get someone to on our YouTube channel, or now that uh, Liam's here, I think that, that makes it kind of empty. No. <laughs> well, you're well, one I active I... follower. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, usually by the time you guys come on, it's I've finished all my homework and I've kind of started. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Oh yes. Oh, speaking oh, yes. of which, yes. cheers to um, <laughs> cheers to everyone. Uh, something happened this weekend. Yeah. What was that, Dan? Um, it was a beautiful, beautiful Sunday. I got to bike outside, spend some time in New York, um, and watch some rugby in America. So, that is uh, yeah. So we got we got to watch rugby, guys. So how how was that? As it a, happened, I guess a crescendo to the weekend. It, it felt like the NFL was back on. Honestly, for me. But this, the pads. No, yeah, ex- exactly. There's nothing better than rugby, but there's there's nothing like the feeling of like you know it, during the NFL season when like everybody's just hyped up, like you know going online to look at media, looking at all the storylines, like getting together to watch the game, and it was finally like that again this weekend where you know watching rugby with friends and stuff like that, reading all the articles online after great time of year. I love it. Is Brady coming back this year? By the way, it's a question. I have uh, yeah, no, the, um, so Don Yee, uh, Tom Brady's agent, just recently confirmed um, to a couple sources at NFL.com that Tom Brady is expected to return. Uh, Gronk is expected to return at this point, but he's just playing games due to a contract dispute. But, uh, you know, we'll see how that goes. Well, um, I hope everything goes Gr- terrible. There. Considering Gronk <laughs> hasn't spent a dime of his, like, contract money, I don't, I don't know how much of a I don't know how much of a dis- like life he's gonna have issues, um, but uh, yeah. So for those new to the podcast, every Monday we come here, we discuss news, rumors from Major League Rugby, the United States Professional Rugby Union competition. It's a dis- chance. Wow, he's stuttering. It's a chance to discuss all the issues, hear from the league, team leadership and check in with our friends from across uh, the U.S. rugby scene. Hey, second week that we have a review to read off. Must listen MLR podcast from Rugby Nation USA. That is Jason Graves. He is, I guess you would call him a venerable club rugby writer. He does tons of club rugby profiles, which are really cool to read. Check him out. Um so there are other rugby podcasts, but if you want MLR news, then Earful of Dirt is your one-stop shop for all things Major League Rugby. The best MLR content and opinions, period. Five stars. Thanks, Jason. Um, thanks for listening. Hope to <laughs> continue uh, the five stars, you know? So, Dan, what happened this week? Um, well, I may have hinted at it before just a little bit, but we had some rugby to watch. Um, this league that this entire podcast is actually built around actually had real games to talk about, the things we've been waiting for for about six months now. So uh, we had our game of the week, Austin at Glendale. Uh, we also had NOLA at Houston, as well as the Sunday night primetime San Diego at Seattle. We have some, I guess, some other banter, some other things to talk about, too. Um 
Utah also hosted the Prairie slash Alberta Wolf Pack, Wolf Pack. Um, and just also just talking about some of the results, the stats, um, some polls we had, and you know, tweet of the week and everything like that. Oh yeah, and um, almost all of us were wrong on every single one of our predictions. So we will talk more about that later. But we're gonna jump into the first match that we, <laughs> the first match that we had, Austin at Glendale. So this was really the second match we had, but it was the CBS game of the week. And we have titled it The Red Wedding for a specific thing that occurred. Why is it titled The Red Wedding? The red cards. <laughs> so red red card. Not one. You sure but it wasn't Chris Asfus' um, clothing? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess you could call it The Red Wedding for two things. Um, uh, Chris, my man. I agree with the person who evaluates you. I think you're the top referee in North America. However, you you can't wear your girlfriend's ref clothes. All right, you gotta you gotta order your own. He's a big guy too. So he can order something a bit bigger. Aaron, I, I just gotta say, I, I took a little bit of offense during that show rundown. I, I, you know, I was in middle school and high school, but you know, by the time you guys were probably like in late high school and college, I loved Paramore. I loved Paramore, and I, I will not take an insult <laughs> to that man very lightly. What? <laughs> oh, what? What? You, 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 compa- you, you compared his clothes to a Paramore fan or something no, like that? No. Paramore is a word for like your lover. <laughs> oh. Well, Aaron, Aaron likes to use words that most people don't normally use. <laughs> I'm an English so, major, and I haven't even heard that shit. <laughs> he likes to use archaic language. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I know you know, you know archaic Indubitably, means English I major. Uh, definitely not. Definitely not about the man, Paramore. <laughs> Brought this kid on. Yeah, Let's I, just mute that microphone real quick. Hold on. Jeez. I gotcha. <laughs> uh. But yeah, so Chris likes to wear tight clothes. He's got some pretty big arms, so yeah. Uh, just order an XL. Get it done. But uh, yeah, so let's get into the match, guys. So for, for most part, I, I would say we saw some good things from Austin. Uh, when they were about to take the sword in the mouth, they capitalized on the penalties and were able to pick – Pick themselves up. They had a good failure recovery system, but at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it was the Raptors' ball game with that forty-one to twenty-six victory. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was it was definitely like a lot more competitive than I thought. Obviously, we all had Glendale winning by like twenty or twenty-five. Um, but like I said, we we kind of messed up some of those predictions. Um, <laughs> it was only a fifteen-point margin, if I'm correct. It was forty-one to twenty-six. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I was it? I think we all picked Glendale by 20. Yeah, some, about... yeah I, I think I had like like 44 to 10 or 15 or something like that. Something insulting. I'm, yes. I, I apologize to Austin. <laughs> yeah, they, they performed um, a bit better. I mean, they had two red cards and also a yellow card at one point, bringing the, uh, the Raptors down to only 12 guys. So, obviously, that helped a lot. But even though they were out of the game near the end, I didn't really feel like the game was over. So they had like 10 minutes left and then they're down by at least two tries, but I felt like it, they're they're still in this. They're you know, there's still a chance. They still have to run. I think a lot of the fans appreciate that too. It's it's different from a lot of sports that Americans are used to where you know, if they're down by that much with that much time left, then it kind of just goes into coasting mode. But well, you got to keep going in rugby. Well, it was only over in the sense that, you know, us as USA rugby fans, we know how the Glendale Raptors play. We knew what they were going to win this game going into it. However, if you put two if you put two other completely different teams against each other and one team goes down, you know, fifteen to twelve men at one point, there's a very realistic chance, no matter how much time is on the clock, that like, you know, a realistic comeback could be launched. But the fact that it's Glendale just kind of changed the whole formula entirely. So but I so think before, later Yeah. Before that yellow, um when they when it was like 14, when it was 15 on 13, uh, and that they got their last score, there was still about like 12, 13 minutes. And I thought Austin, I, the first red card, the way they were playing, I wasn't sure until Hanko scored when it was 14 on 14. And I'm thinking the Raptors are going to are gonna play like the All Blacks and play better with 14 on. 
then they play with 15. Like it, it was it was that ugly. And you know, Austin was able to do what it needed to do, and it was kind of surprising. Yeah, I would have liked to see them when it was down to 12 men really pass it through their backs and just kind of play hands. They weren't really doing that. So that was kind of disappointing where they they had an opportunity and instead of passing to the guy right next to them, they decided to chuck it halfway across the field. And I think the guy had trouble catching it at first. So then the defense kind of caught up. But it's like I, I, I read a lot of the comments too in the um in some of the match threads where where and these are people who are, you know, for the most part overseas, they were all shouting like, just pass the ball, just pass the ball. And instead he was kind of well, passing it all the way down. Well, I think there was that just desire, you know, kind of, you know, by Austin at that point, just to get that numbers advantage, especially when Glendale started being down a couple of people, you know, they probably thought their best chance was get was to get this ball to the outside, you know, make them shift their defense, open up the gaps where they could, and they'd be, they'd be able to hit them where, you know, where it was going to hurt. But Glendale is just too well coached to kind of allow that to happen. Yeah. So, um, you know, interesting – if you want to – let's examine some of the stats uh, for – I think there was a question on Reddit. I think the engine for the stats is still being built out, so I can't really, you know, blast these out. Um, Although but, I will say America's Rugby News, they are great at including uh, all the game time – or mo- most of the game time stats in their review articles, you know, so. So, yeah, but, so, this, is, so this is like – what was provided by the stats provider for MLR. So possession in this game was actually 50, 50. So it was like, really? So, yeah. And uh, one of the things they're working on is getting meters gained uh, down. So that's not available right now. It's pretty tough to, to get, I don't know. I don't know how the technology works, but unless they have a guy just sitting there going like a, a one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> yeah. that, 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 actually, that's how I actually. That's, I thought that's, that's, that's sort how of was. how you do it in football. <laughs> it's like you're. you're looking, well, football is a bit yeah, easier because you get lines on the field and stuff too. And they um, stop every so often. But um, so so time in opponents twenty two was uh, this is where it gets like you look at the kicking game. Um, actually, if you look at the kicking game in a lot of these, uh. They didn't – neither teams – none of the teams spent a lot of time in the opponent's 22. Uh, Austin spent 11 minutes in uh, – within the opponent's – within Glendale's 22, and Glendale spent only 12 minutes in Austin's wow. 22. Uh, this is sort of how you know like, – Yeah, because the they were scoring, you know, from outside the 22 all those times. So. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is one of the things you know how to, like – when you can, if you look at tackles in in rugby, it's like the differential. So Austin made 105 tackles, and Glendale made 84. So to be expected. So, but uh, I'm, I mean, for those listening to the podcast that maybe new to rugby, it's like the team that makes the most tackles, like, and there's a massive differential. It usually means they lost. Um, and which football really? Yeah. So. And then tackles missed. This is where it gets pretty big. Is uh, Austin missed seventeen, and Glendale missed ten, and then handling errors. Uh, this is probably the biggest gap. Uh, was eleven handling errors for Austin and seven for Glendale. And what I found interesting is handling errors are like clearly defined because I would have thought there were a lot more in this game. Okay. Well, I mean, that just kind of goes along with Glendale, you know, having that better chemistry on the field. You know, they, they know how each other plays. They know, you know, like they, they kind of know where to be. It's kind of like how a quarterback and a receiver need to get that timing down. You have 15 guys on the field who are much more familiar with, the, with each other's timing. And despite the fact that a lot of these Austin guys played on the Huns prior to their time with the elite, there's still a bunch of new guys. There's a new system in place. And there's obviously a disparity this early in the season when it comes to kind of executing what your team is best at. Yeah. And plus, as time goes on, guys, those stats, or those errors at least, I hope, should be going down anyway. So those 11 and 7s, I mean, give it a while, they're going to be maybe 5, probably 4. So it really depends. And, of course, usually in, in, in talking about tackles missed, since Austin made way more than Glendale, 
usually the team again that's tackling the most usually misses the most as well. So, Josh, you were uh, you were actually on on the ground there, right? We're we're yes. lucky to have at least one of the 16 or so people who are on this podcast actually in one of the cities <laughs> until next year when New York joins. But Josh, what were your experience at, at the game? I know you were at a preseason match before. Yeah. No, it was good. They got the... Yeah, it's, got the just, just, yeah it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. The, no, only they got... thing, what, the only thing that matters is what was the spread like? <laughs> they got... Um, they had some uh, short rib sliders that had like uh, potato waffle buns they're like hash brown buns they had some cheese and crackers and they had some like chicken skewers all right all right um man all right so they put on a good show okay okay that's what matters it sounds like the um the mercedes-benz superdome down there in atlanta yeah like right before it got built they had those all those stories coming out how like it's supposed to be gourmet food in a football stadium and but then the reality came that it was just the same as every well, other football stadium well i mean when it when it comes to when it comes to food uh, i've been in some locations where the uh, where they don't take care of the press <laughs> Gillette stadium Gillette stadium awful food god damn pets hey <laughs> Oh, Dan, Dan I, w- I wasn't paying attention. I was reliving memories of going to Super Bowl uh, parades. Hold yeah. on, let me just – hold on, I got to mute real, real quick. Just going to hit this mute button. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I'll try uh, to go back. I'll just hit this the entire game, but uh, I – Boston and New York don't really get along, obviously. So, mm-hmm. right. Yeah, for so, those of you that don't, don't know about the rivalry. <laughs> yeah, keep so, living in the 90s, man. The 90s yeah. for the Jets. We never had anything. <laughs> Wrong sport. <laughs> Talking about the Yankee. Well, you're a Mets fan, though. Oh, I guess. Wrong sport. Moving yeah. on to uh, Nola at Houston. So this is this is where we caught most of our grief from the. Uh, <coughs> I would say the uh, the normal folk. <laughs> 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 so uh, you're not normal. So we picked um, the show except for Josh. Me. Um, picked Houston. I think we all said, I think most of us said by 10 and, you know, I, I said to Nate, um, Osborne that you are a confident effing coach because he was like, I think, you know, I think we're going to get a, you know, a couple weeks ago, he's like, we're going to do well and we're going to, you know, win the first game of the season away. It's going to happen. And, you know, I, they had played less games, seemed for the most part, had built, hadn't built as much depth. So I, you know, I, I selected Houston. And to be honest, uh, one of the big things that was going out there as commentary is like uh, the ref uh, wasn't that awesome. Um, the penalty count was actually close. I think it was 16 to 14 uh, with Houston um, committing more penalties. But I, I do think that the refing was an issue, but I don't think it would have helped Houston the way they were playing and probably would have actually helped New Orleans if it was better. Just it, important. Uh, oh, no, ahead, I, I'm sorry. I was going to say important to note he's French and French refs are, are I guess, the tor- <laughs> Yeah. And uh, not only French, he's a French referee with USAR, which really caught me off guard. I didn't even know that guy existed until Saturday. <laughs> He favored New Orleans. He just likes the Bayou. Well, <laughs> they gave they gave him a dozen beignets before the game. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I'm more of a pan au chocolat guy. Okay. <laughs> Done. Well, hey, so going to Houston, could their extensive schedule have actually been a detriment to them? I don't think so yet. I, I don't think so because I mean they they had some injuries, but I, well. One of the issues they're having, I think their first choice tight head is probably Paul Mullen, um, and I think that would have that would have helped having. Well, I guess they have two first choice tight heads. Really, Adam Macklin is a you know former professional prop uh, from Ireland, so I think not having both of those guys kind of affected them. But to be honest, I, I, they just didn't play well, and I don't necessarily no. think that Nola played well, but they didn't commit the same type of penalties. <laughs> Because J.P. Eloff was able to kick for sticks three times and you know score nine points with his foot on penalties, 
So. Well, it was it was just really about like when the best of each team kind of came out. Because in the first half, I saw more of the Houston that we expected to see. These guys, you know, they were more technically sound in the first half. I felt like they got the ball out to the wing and they were able to recycle the ball a lot better in the first half. But then just like, you know, uh, a lot of the critics have been saying during the exhibition uh, season, they fell off in the second half. They, it felt like they were, you know, they felt like they got winded or something, but it just, it didn't seem like they had the moxie left to actually kind of push through and make a comeback. And Nola just totally took advantage of it. Exactly right. And let me tell you guys, I was definitely not expecting the Sabercats to fall on round one, maybe round three, no. probably four, but definitely not from the get-go. So Nola definitely impressed me. And credit to them, they traveled really well. And they got some, those really good points out of J.P. Olaf, not only the forking kicks, but also that one try, also tries from the two Chalene, Sebastian Kalm, and Nikola Bersic. They also got my Houston there as well. Um, by the way, speaking of J.P. Olaf, real quick, I don't know if you guys remember in the post-match interview, shout-outs real quick to him for dropping <laughs> that those random f bomb as he was talking. The funny thing is that he dropped it, and then he sort of like make like this like his <laughs> face. stop for a second. Like, it's like he said like <laughs> he's like oh no the boys are they you, you can tell he's like, but like, yo that wasn't even the best f bomb of the weekend. Connor Cooks when he got the red card was just <laughs> yeah. fuck. <laughs> <laughs> So everyone's like, is it on delay? Is it a money issue? I was like, well, it's on no. cable and it's on OTT, so I don't really think they care about cussing. Yeah. <laughs> I thought they guys were going to say, hey, so, so sorry for the language. No, I think I mean, they just kept it. They, they, just kept they did. I think um, one of the commentators did when Cook cursed, but he was oh. literally like right in front of the ref and he's just like, red, fuck, like right into his face, basically. Um <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's used to being interviewed very often, so I think you can kind of see that too. And uh, Stanford did apologize for the language. Yes, mm -hmm. that's his name, Stanford. I was like, so oh, we, yeah. we we just had uh, somebody in the comment section bring up uh, Jonathan uh, uh, Josh, Joshua Vithi. Joshua yeah, Vithi. Joshua Vithi. Joshua Vithi's game, saying you know he was you know all all fireworks in the beginning, but then he was quite kind of quiet what? towards the end. What? what are you talking more, about? I think it was more about being able to get ball, but. It, yeah, he, that, no, that, well, that's what I was going to say. Wasn't really on yeah, him. because like, he scored two tries, what the heck that person's talking about? It's like, so every time the guy had the ball in his hands, he was a matchup issue. Six and... tackles. Bro it broke broke on the way to that try. It was like a 50 there, plus it, meter it, it, Exactly, not for the first one. That's right, six yeah. tackles. So, I mean, come on. Next. Those, those weren't broken tackles. Those were New Orleans propelling him towards the try line. <laughs> I've never <laughs> seen... Legit. I don't think I've ever seen... A stiff arm actually pushed someone further away. Like, like I think he gained about five miles per hour after pushing off one. <laughs> <Just> pushing <laughs> the one <guy. laughs> so I've been that guy before, though. Getting yeah. it, putting on it's it, put on his ass. Yeah. So I mean, so the interesting you know, the stats here, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, so Nola had ball had forty five percent of the possession to Houston's fifty five. Uh, so think about that. Uh, the opponent's time in 22. So this is all about the kicking game again. Uh, Nola only spent seven minutes in Houston's 22. And Houston, so this is where it gets pretty intense too. It's like they scored for everything from far out. They only spent five minutes in Nola's 22. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, so the... The tackle was made. This is where it gets kind of funny. Um, if I have that correct, actually, let me pull that up. Uh, the tackles made was 70 for New Orleans, and the tackles made for Houston was 86. Handling errors was the same for both teams. 70. Eight, eight. Right. <laughs> well, in, in in regards to the whole uh, like the, the time signatures spent in each other's twenty twos, when you only spend five minutes inside your opponent's twenty two, that means you're having a ton of trouble retaining possession out in the midfield. And 
that that's going to be that, that that's the problem is getting it out to the wings. I think like uh, you know, Coach Coach Fitzpatrick is a Northern yeah. Hemisphere rugby player. He likes that pick and drive, you know, sort of ground and pound and style, especially playing. Yeah, especially yeah, fucking props. But he like he likes that ground and he likes that ground and pound style. But meanwhile, I I, I thought uh, I thought Alex Elkins was way underutilized in this game. You have people like Connor Mills, Osea Kalinasau, Sam Windsor's out there. Like Connor Connor Murphy can take the ball and run, which we saw you know him do a couple times on Saturday. Stop with these pick and drives, you know, especially when you're down by 13 points I mean, and put it out. The way I don't know exactly what was going on. I I've seen the, I've seen them practice. I've seen them play. They they know how to push the ball wide. They know how to use every single one of their wing, like every single one of their guys in their back line. We see how um, Kalinisau and VC are just so good together. But we also see like how good VC is with whoever plays that other wing spot. Maybe it's because Elkins he makes people really, good around him. Yeah, it's like we maybe it's like this. Maybe it's Elkins uh, being new because they've had you know other guys start at the blindside winger spot where, you know, Kalinis Al has just been crazy with his hands and offloaded at the perfect time and you get a, you get a try. So I really don't know what's going on there. The connection didn't seem to be there. I don't, it's, I think coach Fitz, I mean, obviously coach Fitzpatrick will get it fixed and we'll move forward to this week. So the stat that I needed to make sure I had right was tackles miss. So this is where it flips, uh, Nola had 14 tackles miss, and the Cats had seven tackles miss. How many of those 14 missed were on the uh, Vithi try? Well, six genuine, of genuine, them. <laughs> six of them were on the <laughs> That's a genuine question because there <laughs> yeah. were a lot of missed tackles. So at least I counted six on Vithi. Do you count? Do you count some of them as tackles, or just I, kind of tagging? Well, I mean, I counted six. Uh. Yeah. It, it depends. I, I would need – like I didn't see the like inputted metric for who got blamed for a missed tackle Yeah, because uh, that wasn't available. Um, and, by the way, and by the way, guys, real quick, just talking about um, presentation, very different from the, the ESPN broadcast from the CVS Sports Network broadcast. I mean, it's to be expected, obviously. One is again one of the week and one is not. But, um, but really, they were almost on part – they're, we're, they were not completely different, at least in my opinion. I don't know what you guys think, but I will definitely love to hear well, your opinion um, in that regard. Well, CBS graphics, gets the numbers right. Yeah, so, so, well, the ESPN broadcast got the numbers right on Sunday. Um, oh, for the, for the rosters they showed in the beginning. For the, for the roster, for the roster uh, diagram, um, mm-hmm. the graphic that they put up. So, you know, teething, I would I would have thought there wouldn't have been this problem, but it existed and it was fixed. So I think we'll be good this next week. Um, personally, I thought the Houston commentary team was the best of the weekend. That was just me. And I'm not, I really? think the best, the best of the weekend was definitely the radio commentary team of coach Mills and, uh, Grant, Grant Co. But, um, yeah, I, I, Grant Co. I, that I, Texas I, accent. No, you I, can now, sir. I, I thought Hightower did, uh, you know, Hightower's got that, um, smooth, golf commentary like accent the way he's going and then he had an Amer I forget I forget who the American is with him, but they were pretty good. Uh, mm-hmm. but, I actually uh, think Seattle's the best, to be honest. Yeah. I think I so. Know. I personally loved listening to Dan Power, so I have no problem having him. I think the I mean we'll we'll get to Seattle's in a second, but I think that they did a good job with Dan Power is the you know play by play and then um, Pete Seiberg actually did uh, a good job jumping in to make sure he explained the rules, but it didn't feel like it was. It was like it didn't feel overly condescending. It was, you know, at times when obviously some people wouldn't understand certain plays, so it was good for him to jump in just to say, "Hey, just so you know, this is what's happening here." Um, you know, the player is not binding on to the other player, so I, I would wish he says this. I wish the ref says this. You know, something like that. And that that's definitely good because we don't want people to have the feeling as if, you know, kind of like football where they're getting frustrated that the game is stopping, you know, for any reason. So it's good to have that explanation kind of put in there saying, like, you know, this isn't something that happens all the time or this is a normal thing just so the average American rugby fan kind of, you know, understands. So, yeah. Um, 
It was like so that was just some really interesting stuff for for Houston. I you know I was a little surprised, but moving on, uh, let's get into scrum versus the scrum knots. Uh, Seattle wins over San Diego. This was this was awesome. The weather cooperated and the atmosphere was delicious. Uh, you know, they had 3,500 people out and it was just a great atmosphere. What did you guys take away from what they had going on? Uh, what you just said, it was awesome to see. It was, it felt the most professional, which is not a knock on the other ones because obviously Infinity Park is a very professional stadium and arguably better um, than Starfire. But it's just, there's something about the grandstand that kind of um, made it feel more like an English rugby match. And the weather is perfect, which made it not feel like an English rugby match at all, actually. Um, field looked nice, despite the fact they didn't have lines, but the, I mean, the they had lines. They were yellow. Light didn't, yellow. Didn't they were help. very, very light yellow. Didn't I'm, help at all. I'm pretty sure someone went out there with a highlighter and just kind of <laughs> went like this. Um, it felt like the most professional. And I mean, the crowd obviously helped because it was a beautiful day. Seattle always turns out for their sporting matches. They just love sports. They got nothing else up there, really. Um, so it really turned out they were very loud. I think Seattle actually gave away um, a lot of hats and shirts and stuff like that. So everyone was decked out. Um, I know that. In so gear. was it? I, I saw pictures. There was like there was like two to three hundred people in line for the uh, the merch tent because uh, like. Starfire sort of allows, I guess, a, a festival um, type atmosphere. And there was, I, saw, I had a picture, and the line was like 200 deep. People buying, you know, jerseys and whatnot. So that was, that was pretty intense. So yeah, very. A lot of people, a lot of people said they were doing the double. Uh, they went to Sounders before and then checked out the Starfire. Really? So, yeah. so this was this was the cool thing. So Sounders game, same day, right? And Sounders they, average. 43,000 people. And so, and then you had 3,500 because they were sold out um, at this game. That is pretty dope. Um, you know, because I, I talk about developing markets and how, hey, you know, USA played freaking Canada in San Diego um, in July. And, well, uh, they didn't market the game, but the Dodgers were down – down playing San Diego in a fucking freeway series. And of course, you know, no one knows what rugby is, but because there's no advertising. But, so one, um, qu one question I have though, is do you think Seattle could beat Utah's uh, domestic attendance record? If they actually had a stadium to beat that capacity? Um, yes. I think no, so. I don't think so. Oh, I think it would, I think Ooh. that I, I don't, uh, because I think the way things are going with Utah is they could get ten thousand, you know, if you know if they wanted to. Okay, chill. <laughs> the ones, you just look at it. The I think what I do think is going to be needed very shortly is for them to actually win. Well, for Utah to win, but they did actually win on Friday. More, more for Seattle Friday. is that um, they can yank out that away. I guess the traditional away side and bring in. Uh, a lot more temporary seating to expand capacity to 7,000. Um, so that, I think they're going to need to do that based on what's going on. Well, they sold out the next match and they only yeah. have like 150 tickets left for the third match, which is over a month away or almost a month away. I thought it was just 100 tickets for, were left for that match, for the second for the, match. No, the second match sold out. Oh, wow. Done. That's so, awesome. So I think <laughs> they, if... A month away is plenty of time to bring in temporary seating to expand capacity. Yeah. And don't forget they get a waiting list for season tickets next year. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that people are actually on that. So, what, are are we gonna get a Green Bay situation here where you're put on the list at birth? Yeah. Like so. Yeah. What is it? The 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 list uh, for the Steelers is 40 years long or some crap like that. Same here in Denver. 
So I, it's, wow, it's crazy. I can get jet season tickets and just, just like that. It's easy because of the jets. That's yeah. why. Damn. <laughs> in, in New England, we just bring you out to like a, like, like a, like a liquor store parking lot. And we have you fight another guy with the bottle. It's, it's pretty sad. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I think, well, myself and we in general, even though I talk to, you know, we talk to the GM a lot, uh, just like we talked to you know all the teams a lot, I kind of weighed the drama a bit too much with the loss of Tony Healy. Um, but Phil Mack apparently, I mean, I knew he was a coach. He coaches Thunder Rugby, which is the indigenous team on Vancouver Island. Uh, in but he could he's an outstanding coach while playing scrum half. I'll tell you what, yeah, definitely. Definitely, but and and I was really surprised that there wasn't a lot of I don't know th- there wasn't a lot of uh, miscommunications in that game. You know, for a team that was without a coach, was without you know a a, a lot of you know on field playing uh, rugby experience time like with one another, they were so fluid. They were so like you know they were so rehearsed. I was really really surprised, and like that's kind of why I ended up putting my foot in my mouth with all those predictions. And Brian Ray kind of called me out on that last week, and fuck, he was right. I think that I mean that is a good point. They they didn't have any official um, games, but I I'm pretty sure I heard that they scrimmage against the Seattle Saracens quite a lot or quite often, at least once a week. So I think that plays into it too. Also, I think we were at least for me, I was overstating how much the lack of a coach would have because um, it's not like football where if you don't have a head coach, you're screwed because no one's calling the plays. Yeah, like your whole system kind of collapses, and like only well, one guy yeah. is a master of that system. So so coaches are important. But coaches get coaches do four. four was it they they coach for four days a week? Captains run on Friday, and then they get you for ten minutes during halftime. Right? It's rugby is a player led game, whereas coach football, tells is very, football is coach led. And they yeah, tell my, them my college to team in. didn't have a coach for three years. I'm not even shitting you. Well, you had a you had a coach. Yeah, you had a coach. That's pretty nice. You you had a coach. One of your players was coach. Certified. Yeah, no, yeah. It was all the captains, like from like my freshman through like you know like the first semester of my junior year. It was just like all the upperclassmen kind of coaching everybody, and you know we we, we won the division my freshman year. I don't know how it happened, but yeah, there was a. I was like I'm part of a, a coaching group, and there's a senior graduating senior at Eastern Kentucky. They play. In, they somehow play in Division One for women's lacrosse and la, not lacrosse, women's rugby. And they were soliciting, trying to get you know a new coach because she's like the senior captain and she's been you know she's a USAR level three hundred coach. Uh, but she's graduating right, and she, they're trying to get a full time coach in or not well part time coach to volunteer so that they can make it to the next level because it's sort of hard to like make it to the next level you know when you're in college when you're balancing school and trying to coach and play at the same time so i mean coaches matter but apparently not uh not as much uh they matter more for setting the culture of a team i guess you could say but but that's like from doing it from the offset you know what i mean it's yeah and then more important the beginning of the season than they are in the in the meat of it you dig into it well a uh you know phil coaches you know his an, a 15 side but he played for tony healy for three years two with uh, i think it's like all three years at james bay and then uh played for him with the bc bears last year so that he knows the system they're not really changing much and they're just going forward by the way, guys, a uh, quick shout out to John Wilson, who sent us a message through YouTube saying, hi, guys, from New Zealand. Well done on the startup of MLR. Thank you, John. Best, uh, hey, wish you the best down there in New Zealand. I think for you guys, it's like, I think like 12 p.m. I hate you guys, but that's cool. Hey, happy Tuesday. That much I tell you. Happy Tuesday. By the way, guys, let's talk about the important thing regarding this match. Remember, this match is now now and forever will be referred to as penalty try the motion picture. 
<laughs> oh, man. Do we have a committee so for these names? Is is there any way we can get any more input on these? No, I I can no I can vote with that on my own. <laughs> That's not gonna oh, be himself. Can, so, that. No, we're, yeah, we're gonna put that bad. right up on the fridge then, and everybody's gonna see it. <laughs> there we go. Hey, I was being the smart ass when I said this, but penalty try is the man of the match. <laughs> so. Actually, he almost won the... the week, not man of the match. Yeah, try the week. Is, is try, I said man of the match. I just suggested <laughs> try the well, week, too. We... Very close to actually winning the poll. Yeah, that's very close. Hasn't um, currently Hanko Hamishnice is uh, getting after it. So, you know, the, uh, you know, Victor talked about the penalty tries. It was like, so the front row disparity was a bit much for me. Like, I was watching this and... You know, they just got – San Diego just got rocked. Uh, yeah. You had, you know, Kellen Gordon, who is, you know, traditionally he's been a hooker, but he's a, he's a pretty big dude. Uh, slots in fine at loose head, played very well. And then Tim Metcher, uh, super rugby f- a prop from the Melbourne Rebels, just, you know, injuries kind of like got him, over, like, unselected. And he's healthy and he's getting after it. And then you had Ray Barkwell, the venerable – uh, Canadian hooker, just, you know, taking care of it, uh, in the center. And not only did, not only, it wasn't really about the penalty tries for me as much as it was how many, how many scrums did they take away from San Diego? At least oh, like, 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 like how many San Diego put-ins? Like, yeah, San they, Diego I think it was, a lot. it was, a lot. it was over half of San Diego's put-ins. And as a, as a back, I can attest to how freaking frustrating it is to lose possession because your scrum can't get the job done. When you have people like, you know, Ben Seema, like John Stapleton, like Mikey Teo in the back line. Like, you're, you're, you're back. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll just, I'll just take all my career tries. And, and, so and think and about – so if you're a front rower like me, think about how – I'm a and you're a hooker, so you lose the ball. Think about how embarrassing that is. Yeah. It's pretty embarrassing. You should be. So, um, <laughs> hey, can yeah. I get a little respect for my um, my fifteen now? <laughs> Sorry. Was for that English your, for your first fifteen selection? Yeah. Hey, it wasn't bad, you know. <laughs> uh, but um, so then there was a uh, Cam Polson's try. Was that beautiful? It was that the was first real oh, try. It was great. Was it the only actual try by Seattle? I think no, it was. No, was, no the first uh, the first one by um Staller. Staller. Yeah. That was excellent. Ex- yeah. Staller that was, is currently the uh, leading point scorer in the MLR right now, I believe, actually. Not surprised. He has yeah. a really, really yeah. nice uh, but, boot. Excuse me. But <laughs> Yeah, that was – I mean, the, the way that's set up, you can just see – San Diego's defense, whoever it was that was supposed to tackle Staller, just take a step too far and just open up a, a wide hole. And Staller really hit it on pace. And it was just just perfect. And I, and all the fans were so happy to actually see a try because they had, I think, two taken back, one or two that were almost tries, but but got taken back, I think, because a forward pass or something like that. I don't know. I do remember the forward pass. I was watching it yeah. at work, and I was like, <laughs> I, I was rooting for San Diego the whole time. Just, you know, indifferent. Yeah. Just trying to figure out who's going to lose next year when, when Rooney takes over. Mm. Become the entire team. <laughs> Are they? By the way, real quick, guys, Rock I just Rock want to point out. like the third leading scorer, not the mm-hmm. – because uh, Will McGee has 16. Um, J.P. Eloff has 14. And Staller has 11. So. Okay. So, All yeah. right. So no, guys, I was just want to point out that in terms of predictions, the only one who said Seattle was going to win was me. So I would get that point. I just want to make. So I just Do you make want that. a cookie? <laughs> you you could. Well, well hanging up there right on the fridge. Victor was right. I mean, like I said, I just I gave. I think the rest of us gave too much. You know in. We listened to the drama a little bit too much. And I found the peer pressure really. <laughs> so, yeah, but I mean, it I mean, wasn't totally. It's not totally unreasonable to have thought San Diego was going to win that game, though. I mean, they have, they have 
great they're, players. They're, yeah, their team is blooming with Eagles. I just think except, there was a, uh, except uh, propping. Yeah, no, that that scrum was absolute shit. Like you know, like so so on on the serious side of what I was saying before, in terms of being a back, you you have guys like John Stapleton, like Ben Sima and Mikey Teo, who if they act, if they get the chance to have their ball in their hands, they can create space just by recycling that ball, you know, like in and out. But when well, you're not even getting chances at possessions on your own put-ins in a scrum, in, and let's be honest, in professional rugby nowadays, nobody puts it down the tunnel straight. I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody. Well, so. Well, no one was putting it down the straight earlier, except that the scrum half had to be uh, better with his actual like ball put in skills, so that it spun on towards their own hooker. Now, because you're able to like angle your like shoulder with the law change, you just kind of like put it in there, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, I but the San Diego backs when they got the ball. They played well. Uh, you know, I I, I thought I thought Anthony Salabar was able to make tons of gains when he had the ball. Uh, you know, break, you know, break tackles and move forward. Very physical kid, liked seeing him play. And what's funny is like when that when he was announced uh playing for them, I thought he was a I thought he was a loose forward because he's like pretty freaking big. But you know, it's good to have a big bruising outside center, I think. Does anyone um so I know that um when they did they did actually get the ball out obviously pretty quickly because their backs are their strong suit. Um the San Diego defense actually held really well against them, despite the fact that their their um specialty was with the forwards. I think they, they knew that San Diego was gonna just pass it out and they were they made sure they're there. They had a lot of tackles behind the game line, and I don't know exactly how many times that happened, but I can remember at least two times where they were within the twenty two and they just – San Diego had to keep going through so many phases just because Seattle was completely stuffing them every time they tried to run with the ball. So, and they weren't exactly gaining ground, like, you know, on, on, on every one of those passes. Like if, if anything, they were kind of losing a meter or two on the majority of them. So, you know, you, yeah. you can recycle it all you want. If you're not gaining ground, it's not actually going to do shit. So, exactly. so looking, at, looking at that, and we're talking about, like, you know – where the teams gain ground. So looking at the stats, uh, San Diego uh, had 48% of the possession. Uh, Seattle had 52. And again, kicking and not being able to get out of your own half really is time in opponents 22. And we saw this early on uh, with Seattle. They just – San Diego's defense played well early, uh, except for, you know, in the scrum, uh, you know, time in opponents, 22 San Diego had 13 overall minutes versus Seattle's 11 tackles made versus, uh, tackles missed. This is where it shows. It's really close. Uh, San Diego had 90 tackles made 89, um, tackles made for Seattle and then tackles missed. There was only a differential of two San Diego with 13 and Seattle with 11. And then, but the handling errors seven to nine. Uh, the the big one was the turnover battle, uh, and the reason why I didn't talk about it with the other games was it the turnover battle wasn't nearly as significant. Uh, <laughs> Seattle got fourteen turnovers to seven. That was a two to one ratio on on turnovers. Well, it 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 was pretty it was pretty visible throughout the game that Seattle was possessing the ball a lot more. You know, you, you felt I or I felt at least that San Diego would only have the ball at a time for a couple passes, but the majority of the time I felt like it was this, you know, it was the Seattle Seawolf show. So, yeah, not exactly surprising. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Especially with that powerful scrum out of Seattle. Really not a surprise. Uh, they get 14 turnovers of all things. It's quite cool. It's not too shabby at all. Yeah. Dang it. But yeah, to, let me tell you guys, that, that Seattle crowd just sold me that match, I had to say. that It, it felt professional, so, mostly because of the crowd. So are we on the super snooty, respect the kicker, be silent when the op opposing kicker is I am. getting I after am. it, or are I we am. on no. the 
let the fans of each team decide what their environment is going to be like. Yes. Like th this is the problem right now with, you know, people being like, Oh, your rugby has to have strict tradition. We have to, ha you know, show proper respect. This is the United States. We have a different sporting culture. And I get that, you know, over in the UK, they have the whole respect the kicker thing, but go to any NFL stadium, go to any MLB stadium, go to any NHL stadium. When it suits the home team, the fans are going to get into it. And that's what makes going to a sporting contest in the United States so worthwhile. So, yeah, no, I, I say go ahead and boo, boo the shit out of the kicker. The other thing on that, on that too, is, is it's really – like it's the kind of thing you don't just force on the fans. And there were a lot of people who were saying, oh, I hope the league gets involved. So why, why do you want the league to get involved? It's, if, they're, if they're completely silent, that's awesome. Like seeing Munster at, at Thoman Park when it gets completely silent, like that messes with the kicker if the place gets completely quiet. But it doesn't always happen to be the case. Seattle, especially, is known for being loud. They're known like that whole twelfth man stuff, and you know, their stadium just being one of the loudest stadiums around. That's what they're known for. They're known so, for disrupting so the other look, team. So you saw the like the rain cover. One of the things that does is like it keeps the ambient like sound from the crowd in, and that was one of the biggest things about uh, you know U Dub's old old stadium before they yanked it out and put in new uh, stands, but it's sort of like that now anyways, with the way the, uh, the canopy is and it just keeps the sound in. And if, you know, American rugby fans want to get rowdy, let them get rowdy. And every MLR stadium, the culture towards different things doesn't have to be the same because Houston is, you know, there's tons of expats there. They're buying into be respect like be silent during kicking but you know let the, if, let the fans decide let the boys cheer <laughs> let the boys cheer i like that now see guys guys see i'm one of those traditionalists i like just again they're just prospecting the kicker but that's just me of course but like if again you're a traditionalist you should be a baseball fan <laughs> <laughs> i am dominican so i am i am a baseball fan to a certain extent. Baseball is too boring. That's why I like rugby instead. Okay, so let's move, guys, to the f uh, next match. Not so, really MLR, but I, still. I, so I didn't watch this one. Um, I, I did. I'll I, talk about I, it. I was at a baseball Yeah, I, I, I watched um, it. I wrote an article on it. But uh, oh, overall, uh, you know, this one was expected, to be honest. Uh, it wasn't nearly... The Wolfpack side that came down wasn't even as strong as the Wolfpack side that played uh, Seattle in that controlled scrimmage. Uh, what I didn't really want to see was, you know, Josh would be going down with yeah. a compound fracture. So especially that, that in the ex especially in an exhibition season, and there was this whole storyline. Um, I shouldn't even say storyline because it, it was a it was a true tragedy. Uh, the Whippy brothers had a, a death in the family prior to the game. I think it was the night before. Wow. And they I didn't and, know and yeah no mm -hmm. and, and uh, their their um their uncle, their uncle um, yeah. I'm blanking on his name, but him. Yeah, it, it, it was a real tragedy, and I can totally understand how the two of them wanted to go in there and make a real impact. But the fact is that his injury happened, I think, in like the last 10, 15 minutes of the game. The last I think eight if minutes. You're, yeah, the last eight minutes. So I think if you're Alf Daniels, I think you should have been a bit more realistic in terms of what you were going to do at that point of the game and take them out, especially considering they they were two of your best players, you know, minus Kurt, Kurt Morath, who's coming in, you know, in the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, just an unfortunate situation, you know, and all in all. And for those of you that haven't watched the match, just to let you know, we're just talking about the Utah Warriors match against the Prairie or quote unquote Alberta Wolfpack. Yeah, it's. Uh... Oh, you know, it was. It Is was Victor cool. gone? Mm. Is he frozen for you guys too? Yeah, oh yeah. That, that <laughs> So that, that happens that, like once a show. Don't worry. That, that happens. So yeah, um, you know, it was it was tough to, it was tough to see. Uh, yeah, I guess you know Jared Whippy was you know having kicking issues again, but uh, based on circumstances, uh, it may have had something to do with uh, everything else. Um, yeah, well, actually, Whippy was a lot better with kicks. Uh, he went eight for ten. 
Um, however, just, you know, in, in the interest of fairness, I will say those two missed kicks were two of the only kicks that weren't exactly lined up dead on with the goal because a lot, a lot of those tries were put down underneath the post. So we had a lot of pretty easy shots, you know, throughout the entirety of that game. So I, I think, you know, now that Kurt Morath is, is coming onto the team, he's most likely going to be taking the kicking duties because, you know, all, all, all the love to Whippy in the world, but I don't think he was – a sustainable kicker uh, for the majority of the MLR season. Hey, I, I will say, Hakiafu, perfect backup. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, Afu, Paki, he, he can kick, man. I mean, he's the... He's they look the, like oh, shit, but he can kick. He's the all-time point scorer for freaking Tonga, right? Pretty sure. Is that Paki or is that Fetu? I believe so. Yeah, the the commentator of the game said something about him being the leading point scorer or something. So, um, yeah. Um, hey, Victor, you're back. And, uh, yeah. So sorry. I'm moving, there for a moment. So moving on. Uh, you know, quick shout out to the Arrows in their victory over Mystic River. Um, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> Hold on. so I, I would oh just like God. to put this out right now. Um, there is no team in America called the Boston Mystics. Um, there's been this. We haven't been referring to. So I have so, not. So, been... so, not so, so not you guys, but a, a number of of other individuals in the rugby media have been referring to them as the Boston well, Mystics. They're, they're like they're like trying to trying out this brand or something, and I'm just like, hey, hey guys, um, do what do what Houston did. Do what Rugby United New York is doing, which is don't rely on one club's brand because that is not um, – it's not really unifying when you want everyone to come because, yeah. for some, you know, we're very, we're very tribal, right, in rugby. You, we have a lot of bad blood with different clubs. It's just, just the way it is. You always hate that one oh, yeah. across town and miss well, it, you know. Is probably that one club because you know at one point the Boston Irish Wolfhounds were the top dog, and then at the one Irish point, Wolfhounds know, are. A, I, I I don't want to say anything too explicit, you know, on the podcast, but the Irish Wolfhounds are not a threat to the Mystic River Rugby. Well, no, club no one's really a threat to Mystic River now, but I want to point definitely out not the Pilgrims. That somehow Mystic is going to the playoffs, and they haven't won a game. Think about that. That's Nerfu for you, dude. That's yeah, no, it's it's a shit show. So uh, the um, New England, the, yeah, New England Rugby Football Union, yeah, so. Union, yeah. But um, so, and we've got the Player of the Week. And by the way, guys, Player of the Week goes to Philip Mack. Mack is scrum half and coach of the Seattle Sea Wolves, which also, by the way, won the Team of the Week uh, awards by MLR. So congratulations oh, I- to both. Was Phil Mack on your starting 15? That is what I want to know. Or uh, first 15, what the hell you call it? No. But no, was, no, he was not. There's, there's <laughs> a reason for that. <laughs> it's one of the week. He doesn't need to be there. And he's a player of the week. Why does he need to be on the first 15? Seriously, I completely agree. It's pretty, pretty simple, right? Straightforward. Um, so, okay. Correction. It wasn't. It's not Pakistan Onasiafu. As the leading try scorer for Tonga, that is Tuvalu Vainikolo. So that's right. There you go. Um, um, moving on to the try of the week poll. Uh, here's the current results. It closes tomorrow. What do we got? Right now we have Joshua Vithi from Houston with 29%. Um, Hanko Hammerschlees from Austin with 32%. So he's currently leading. Cam Paulson from Seattle with 13%, and um, the penalty tries for Seattle with 26%. Currently tight for th- for second place. So I will actually say that, that technically it's not the try of the week because there were three. So it's the tries of the week. It was just, you know, <laughs> it's yeah, the penalty tries by Seattle were an option. I, don't, yeah, I, I was being a smart ass when I suggested it. Hey, yeah. the, people, the people spoke. They wanted it. There's almost like a hundred votes for that. Think about that. Yeah, but like, I mean, like, come on though. Like, it's just like penalty tries are so frustrating because there's no competition to it. Just like you, you fucked up. So I'm done with this series. Let's let's give the other team points. But let's... they got three of them. 
which is the craziness. Yeah, well, you, yeah. you know, that's, that's mad crazy, but that's, you know, that, that's up to the referee, I guess. There's other referees in this country that would have been like, play it out until you can scrum it out, bruh. So, mm. people also... Uh, and by the way, we have right now 293 votes. Thank what, you for everyone that has voted. What did you guys oh, yeah. think of... What, what was your game of the week? What are you picking as your game of the week? Houston Nola, actually. I, so I, I just want to say this first because all of you guys like chose San, mm. yeah, San Diego versus Seattle. Nah, yo. But so, I didn't... Well, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so I chose Houston versus Seattle one because it was an upset. Uh, at, like all of us went into this game believing that Houston was the clear cut winner, except for freaking Josh, I suppose. He decided he yeah <laughs> yeah he went with freaking Nola, but. No, I, I thought it was a back and forth contest. You uh, you you had the team leading at halftime, eventually lose the game. You had a bunch of splash plays by people like Joshua Vithi and uh, Joely uh, T uh, Takoi Suva, uh, who uh, the JoJo Takoi Suva. The, yeah, J uh, Takoi. He he was really really impressive in that game. I thought there was a lot of don't you know, say his first name long. Okay, just yeah. Him Jojo. So yeah, jo Jojo Takoi Suva along with Joshua Viti and, and, and people like that. I thought it was made for a really entertaining match, especially in the backline battle. You know, can, and also two of the best scrums in the league, especially with that big three of Nola, uh, Biden, Tar, and uh, Howard. Yeah. So yeah, I went with that for my game of the week. But y'all can talk about Seattle and San Diego if you want. Cool. It just looked nice for my eyes, basically. It, I mean, mm -hmm. likewise, that's also my I, game of the week. It's the game of the week because I got it wrong. Um, and because of how they won, which was the big uglies, the boys up mm -hmm. front, my people. It's always more than fun. That's right, the mules, the ox, the oxen. If you want to call them that? Yeah, I mean, I saw a lot too on the match threads because we had a lot on um, the rugby union sub thread or subreddit, which is primarily people who don't live in the U.S. Though there was obviously a lot of U.S. Um, fans in there too. Um, but overall, the comments were like night and day when they were seeing like uh, Nolan Houston or um... Landon Awesome. Yes. So those those two games, and then they saw Seattle, and like wow, this is awesome. But I think the crowd also played a lot into that, and the it, it was turf, but you couldn't really tell it was turf. Um, I know people obviously have issues with turf, like myself, but um, it just overall looked very pretty, basically, which is. You know, the first thing that's going to really stand out to you. So, I I mean, so pretty much half the premiership is playing on what they call 3D, which is they're, they're calling them plastic, but they're playing on turf. And then the other half of the premiership, I think there's only one grass pitch. Yeah, the, I think the stoop is the only grass pitch left in the premiership. Everyone else is playing on hybrid turfs. So, Actually, speaking of turf, did you see the Seattle player who had the blood all on his face? I'm pretty sure it's because his face just rubbed on the turf. Did you which, see that? which Seattle player? Like Bryce Oh yeah. 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 I was actually I was actually going to say as as anybody who's ever played a rugby game, I hate playing on turf. Like well, it, I mean, it's it, not it, my favorite. Thing. So sports in general, I hate playing on turf. But that is for some weird reason the way things are going. Um, hybrid. Hybrid is actually all right, I gotta say, because um, it is mostly grass, and then the, the plastic stuff just stops it from eroding away when you play, you know, thirty rugby matches on it in a weekend. Like it's, most, it's grass it's rough. The, the the worst turf I've ever played on is Franklin Pierce University because it's not the grassy kind of turf that you know you can kind of deal with. It's like that like that carpet kind of like you know turf where the yeah it kind of. Yeah, it kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's you, you, your cleats get like get caught in it and stuff like that, and it's just it's it's not fun to hit the ground on. No, I but, I got I got terrible. I was just showing it off. I got really bad turf burn in my elbow and my knee from um, all that touch rugby you play. Yeah, from the touch rugby. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I did get it once because I dove for a try, but I, last week I tried to tap tackle someone, and um, key emphasis on tried um, it, <laughs> it did not work out too well for me. So, Corey, what did you think? Yeah, well, I just jumped on real quick to kind of join in this one. I wanted to be sure to share some thoughts because mine's more of a story than anything else. I actually picked uh, the Houston Nola game as well. 
uh, for my game, match of the week. Uh, and that's primarily because, first, it was the first game I watched of Major League Rugby of the regular season. That was pretty special. Um, second, my wife and I actually took supper over. Uh, we watched it after the fact. We had some family obligations in the afternoon, so we watched it time shifted. But we watched it Saturday night, took pizza to her mom's house. And all three of us sat and watched this game, and uh, it was the first time, uh, probably first time my mother-in-law had ever seen rugby. Uh, and so, she loved to, it, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a learning experience for a lot of people, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about Major League Rugby is it's accessible. It's something that, uh, it's it, for many people, it's going to be the first time they're maybe experiencing that, and I just. As an introduction, I thought that was an, a good way to start us off. I, I, was, I was fine with the game. You know, I don't know that it wasn't necessarily the most exciting game. I definitely uh, cheered and jeered a lot more at uh, the Seattle-San Diego game. But just from a personal perspective, it means a lot to me uh, that that was the first game. So that was my match of the weekend. <sighs> And by the way, guys, real quick, um, now that I'm, Corey mentioned that that story about watching a game with his mother-in-law for the first time, it just brought memories and also a quick shout out uh, to my former uh, rugby watching buddy, Mr. Thomas Lawrence Kim Kimsey, who unfortunately passed away last year. He was a colleague of mine, and um, he was my rugby dude, and unfortunately passed away last June, so it's been almost a year since... He passed away, and he was really excited for watching MLR when the, it was announced. Unfortunately, he won't get the chance to watch it. Mm. But, um, but yeah. It's got the best seats in the house right now. Yes, yeah, definitely. Right, right right up there in the heavens, I hope. Yeah. So shout-outs to, shout to him. He was like my my grandpa, my second dad. I love that man. So, yeah. so Cheers to him. Josh, what was, what was your match of the week? I went with Glendale and Austin. Not just because I went there. Um, actually, something cool that they did was they brought Hawk Quest, which is a nonprofit. Um, they rehab wild birds. So they brought um, two falcons, a bald eagle, and an owl for the for the pregame festivities. Um, Austin played a lot better than I thought they would. They definitely showed better than their last place predicted finish. And honestly, that probably could have been because um, part of it was, play was experimenting during the preseason. So, I mean, I, I love seeing Falcons out there getting after it. So, uh, well, I, I, actually consider, I actually considered putting Austin and Glendale as my game of the week. Just, you know, one, to be different, but two, also just because of the stand in the second half that Austin made defensively and especially the, you know, the comeback attempt that they made. It actually kind of made for some really exciting rugby, despite the fact that you kind of knew what the result was going to be, you know, in the end. So... All right, so going back to look at uh, what our predictions were. Uh, so um, I I went one and two last week, um, and I was also off by uh, all of the points. Uh, Glendale obviously won by, I think it was 15. I had mm -hmm. Glendale minus 20. I had Houston minus 10, and NOLA won by nine. So, and then San Diego minus seven, and, you know, we all saw what Seattle did to San Diego. Um, Victor, what did you have? So I was, as I mentioned before, I, I got the Seattle game down, so I'm happy. But all the numbers were all over the place. So I'm, I actually went one for three, eh, which is one for three. Good. One for three, yeah, exactly. I think one right out of three games. No, you're you're one for two, one of you're one and two. But you really you got oh, you, okay, okay, okay. So, I am sorry. So we're going by – so the score is how many you get right, period. The handicap okay, is just the number. So you're two and one. Okay, well, there we go. So that, that, that I am. But, yeah, I got the numbers definitely quite wrong. And my Seattle was um, by 10, and the game was 39 to – 23. 23. Thank you, Josh. So I was off by a few. But hey, that's what it is. Okay, so that's that. Uh, so yeah, speaking, Josh, go ahead. Uh, I went. I went two for one. I had Glendale by twenty. I picked Nola. I only thought they were going to win by two. They ended up winning by nine. 
And I had San Diego by five. Very nice. And I had um I was also two and one, so I had Glendale. I'm sorry, one and two. I wasn't that lucky. Uh, Glendale, I picked by 20. They won by 15. Um, Houston, I picked by seven. I was definitely wrong there. San Diego, I picked by 12. Um, also very wrong there. Um, so that's what I got. Corey? Yeah, well, kind of like the rest of you. I'm uh, one and two right now as well. I had Glendale by 12, uh, Houston by eight, and then uh, San Diego by 12 as well. So, yep. Uh, glad Glendale won at least. So, yeah. uh, I will just quickly point out uh, that uh, we're going to be uh, doing this throughout the season. So, if you uh, check out earfulofdirt.com towards the end of every week, we'll be posting our predictions for the weekend. And you can always uh, catch up with stuff there and then uh, remind us how wrong we are after the fact. <laughs> so, I think really at the end of the day, our, our conclusion from this weekend, with the exception of uh, Victor, who beat the odds. Uh, the rest of us were pretty much wrong. So, yep, that's that's where we're at. So you guys want to go right into uh, being wrong about next week as well? Yeah, so first game, uh, Austin versus – Austin at Houston. Uh, I, I guess I'm giving uh, Austin a lot more credit based on their performance. But, uh, you know, they, they haven't won yet in the preseason or, uh, you know, in the regular season. So – I'm going to say Houston minus five. Next. Hi, Liam. Oh, um, yeah, so. Wake up. I was, <laughs> I, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't quite aware of the order. I, I thought it was just going by the order of the people on my screen. But um, I'm, I'm going to say. You're in purple behind me. I, I, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> might be. College kids. Yeah, no, sorry, no, I'm not, I'm not looking at the rundown right now. I'm also off in La La Land, but basically to the game. Uh, I'm going to say it's going to be a, a relatively low-scoring game just because I like how uh, Austin is uh, on defense. I'm going to say uh, Houston 28, Austin 14. Okay, so 14-point difference. Okay, cool. Let's put that down. Okay, so I'm also going Houston, guys, um, over, over Austin. I'll say by 11. So let's go with that one. I had Houston too, but I had Houston by seven, so a bit a bit smaller. I think it's going to be a closer game. Um, I know we didn't expect the Houston outcome from this week, but I, um, I, we also didn't expect from Austin as well. So I think Austin is going to perform better than we thought from this week, and Houston I think will play a bit better than last week, but still not, not a huge uh, differential. I'm also trying to play it safe because I, I completely messed up last week, so I'm just – Going with simple, like five points, six points. That's it. <laughs> so I feel like every rugby analyst score prediction is always within like the same sort of margins, you know, because nobody wants to insult another team, you know, by predicting a blowout. Yeah. Unless it's Glendale. Well, I mean, I've been, the, I've been the asshole, I guess, to dick. go with predictions. Uh, well, yeah, I'm actually a dick because you know dicks do. Yeah. yeah. Watch Team America and you'll find out what I mean. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but uh so usually on Fridays uh, during the preseason I went on Facebook Live and did my predictions for each of the preseason games and I always like put a number on it. I you know I'm I'm willing that's why we're doing this is like we're putting our opinions out there and we're gonna put a number on it and I'm cool with wearing it uh like I did. You know, I tweeted at uh Phil Mack. And I was like, gave him a hat tip, you know, and I wore it. Uh, so, you know, it just is what it is. So, Josh, what do you got? I'm going with Houston by 15. I think Houston kind of kept it close together against NOLA, and I think they'll open it up this week. I went ahead and went big. We were talking about blowouts. I'm going Houston by 20. I no. think. Whoa! <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> Whoa. I, I'm I'm worried about Austin. I continue to be worried about Austin. So the and, and we're I'm good a reason. lot less worried after this weekend, though. The reason why I'm less worried, or I'm not worried, I guess the they they have a scrum, they have forwards, and you know as they say, forwards determine who wins, backs by how much. So. If you don't believe that, at Seattle. 
So that's very true. Um, moving on, uh, Glendale at Seattle. I've got Glendale minus five. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, man. I got. Th- th- this is a hard one, just because I'm really gun shy about predicting against Seattle. But I'm gonna go. Glendale, Will McGee wins this for them in the kicking game. Glendale by nine. I hope you're right. i also going to go Glendale by a converted try, so by seven points. I'm going Seattle by six. Hey, and I don't have much to base this off of, it except for the fact that I liked what I saw overall. Oh, I man. This is going to be money to talk about next I, week. I want oh, to dude. be with you. Dude, I, I, was like, I want to be with you, but my gut just says that uh, – Seattle's gonna make it tough, but I, I'm I'm staying. You know that that's why I, I'm sta- I'm staying within the range of of penalty kicks right now. I don't think this is gonna get decided, you know, very quickly or in like or in like the first half or anything like that. This is going down to the wire. I mean, I, I really, I mean, deep down, I I really think or know that Glendale's gonna win, but I'm 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 I got something in it that's just thinking that Seattle. I mean, I've only seen one game of them, and I liked what I saw, so that's really all I'm basing this off of. I'm with Liam. I think the penalty kicks will decide it, but I think Will McGee slots the last second penalty kick for the win. And no, by three. I'm going to go ahead and uh, go opposite you. I'm going to say Seattle by three, and only because I think I, I'm, I'm starting to think Starfire, uh, yeah, Starfire might be uh, magic. I think they might have uh, something pretty special going on there, just the crowd and everything else. So I like what I saw as well, and it uh, will be interesting to see. So you're putting your money on the 16 men, right, Corey? The 16 men. Yep. So, it will be in Seattle, right? Yeah. yeah. That might the the week. That might actually come into factor there. And it's also at 10.30 Eastern time, which I really hate. But uh, Welcome to the club. Well, yeah. hey, that's just because but... CBS Sports is showing the D1 semis that day, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Great it's going to be a day full of rugby. That's going to be so, good. Mm-hmm. But, um, I love it on CBS Sports Network. Um, so moving Thank on, you. Uh, you. the last game, um, which is also on Saturday, I think it's actually before then, um, Utah at San Diego. So, you know, this is sort of the battle of the, the scrum knots right now, but I, I you, Utah more or less so. I yeah, think Utah, you, I has think Utah out. more or less so, uh, still trying to figure out their system up like uh, with the forwards, I think. But, you know, I I didn't think that the Wolf Pack was enough for uh, Seattle to prep for San Diego. But they beat them, you know, 47 to 7. Well, uh, Utah bent uh, the Wolf Pack over and, you know, just spanked them. So I'm, I'm going... Utah minus 10. Okay, then. So, what about you, Liam? If only he knew he Liam, was muted. Unmute. unmute. Here <laughs> I am. Yep. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, before I unmuted, I was actually saying some really philosophical things. You guys absolutely would have thought I was a genius, but I guess I'll dumb it what down for life? you now. Yeah. Philosophical? You're in college. The answer is 42. <laughs> That's your like entire job no, is No no joke. I'm actually I'm actually a philosophy minor. Yeah, as <laughs> Yeah, right. Awesome. Man, English yeah. beer with Damn my it. freshman philosophy. Liam, why did you not choose something marketable? But <laughs> but uh no, uh so I'm 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 going to uh, San Diego by 15 on this one. Um I I think despite the problems in their scrum, I think uh I think Utah exhibited a lot a lot more issues that they need to fix against the Wolfpack because the, as Brian Ray and everybody has kind of pointed out, the Wolfpack had a much lesser squad than they would have fielded against other opponents, but Utah still was having a ton of problems. I think that's going to be the deciding factor. San Diego scrum gets, uh, you know, kind of gets a reclamation on this one and they win the game by 15. You know what? I'm also going to give the nod to San Diego just because I think the Legion and as, as time goes on, obviously they get better, and they know they have to push and finally get that win. So 
I mean, just like Utah, obviously. But I'm going to give it to San Diego, let's say, by an uncoverted try, so by five points, just to be fair, I think. But yeah, we- I'm putting San Diego by seven. Um, I think it's really just by a try, so it could be five in that case. But, I mean, we we saw this last week. It, there's still so many unknowns, and especially because we still haven't really fully seen Utah play. Um, I guess I'm just going with, you know, San Diego lost. They're going to be pissed off. They don't want to lose again. They have a lot of talent. Um, they, I think I they're, they're just. I think they're just going to. They're going to come back. I mean, if Utah won, I, I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't be. Uh, you know, completely out of my mind, basically. I, but it's. I, it's. I say I'm kind of. I'm kind of either way. That's that's why I only want to put up by one try because it, it can really go either way in my head. Mm-hmm. I second your point. Yeah. I got Utah by an unconverted try. I think they took a lot from the Arrows match and especially the scrum. And I think they used that to push San Diego around a little bit. Maybe not as much as Seattle. We probably won't see a penalty try. But if we do, penalty try might just be the MVP of the year. But I got Utah by five. And I'm going just a little bit bigger. I'm going to go Utah by 10, uh, matching Aaron there. I think uh, Utah is going to bring the heat. I'm really feeling good about what they've got to offer. So um, there you go. Look for the prediction article out uh, that, you know, is going to talk about how wrong we are, apparently, because I'm sure that's what will happen is we'll just be really wrong and we'll be talking about how we're really wrong next week. Uh, Player signings this week. uh, Not really to go into them. Uh, Mike Brown and Ross Deacon uh, have been optioned from Rooney. Or from New York on loan to Austin Elite Rugby for this season. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Mike Brown earned the start, like after a week of practice, took over uh, the starting position, and Chris Shade moved over to loose head prop. And then uh, JD Duplaces uh, what? started at inside center. Duplaces? It's Duplaces. Duplaces, bro. Come on. Du- okay, okay. JD Duplaces. Duplessis, Duplessis. It's Afrikaans. Come on. It's like French. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's like Dutch. What are you talking about? Um, whatever. JD Duplessis um, for San Diego. If you don't know who he is, he played some a good, nice amount of Super Rugby, and he's still pretty young. So check him out. Uh, on the injury report, uh, Josh Whippy compound fracture. And then uh, Riker Hatting, uh, he's I think he's concussion protocol now. I have to ask that question. He looked he, a, he looked very lost when he got hit. I have to say, like I don't think he knew what country he was in. He was back in yeah. South Africa. And then he uh, probably thought he was in Canada. <laughs> practically is. Oh no, oh, coach! I got Canada. I got the CTE. That's not okay. even a funny uh, joke. <laughs> no, no, but um, and then Jerry. Missalego, the missile, was also injured in that match. I think he's all right, but uh, he came he, off. He the came back in. Oh, he did. Okay. Yeah. They had they had to they had to tape him up again. Oh, well, I, I, I guess I missed that one because I saw him lying down, and I was like, "Well, he's done." Um, moving on uh, to the tweet of the week. Oh, that's my job. From from, uh, from Dan <laughs> himself. Yeah, different Dan, though. Um, so this is tweeted by our great CEO, or I don't even know what to call him anymore. It's, it's confusing. Um, but his tweet was, as far as my son will know, rugby has always been a professional sport in the USA. Congrats to, to the league office, owners, coaches, players, and most importantly, the fans for USMLR. Everyone buy tickets, merchandise, take a friend to the game, get on board at USA Rugby at Payne NFL, who's his brother, Seth Payne, who uh, works down in Houston and actually knows Grant Cole and a bunch of the other guys in rugby down there too. Um, but the with the tweet was a picture of his kid watching the game on the laptop. And, you know, his kids looks like he's probably seven or eight years old. So obviously he knows rugby wasn't always in the U.S. But His kid is two. Is that how old his kid is? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whatever. So, I mean, his kid's watching, and, and even though he will know in the future, obviously, then I guess that rugby hasn't always been in the U.S. as a professional sport. He will grow up his entire life, and the teams will be there. You know, it, it won't be 
um, like us, where we're in our 20s or 30s um, or 40s, I'm not sure, um, and watching a brand new league. It's basically your entire life. So I'm really, you know, really happy for him. Um, all right. But speaking of Dan Payne, this is why I, I said I wasn't really sure what to call him exactly. Training um, topics from Josh. So yeah, speaking of Dan Payne, he is now the CEO of Rugby Americas. So he's in he's in charge of Rugby Americas North and Pseudo America Rugby. So uh, Dan said he was going to take some time away from rugby and resign to CEO of USA Rugby. And, well, it looks like World Rugby uh, was like, we can't lose you. And made him s- <laughs> just well, became just became the USA Rugby's boss. Well, I mean that's a good ally for USA Rugby to have, you know, in yeah. the you know the World Rugby hierarchy. Is you know the guy who used to run the entire organization is now the North American Rugby Czar, essentially. Yeah. So oh. I'm 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 all good with that. The and, entire the entire hemisphere. Yeah. Not 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 just North America, but South America as well. So that's and with. with with Dan too, and the reason why we liked him so much is that he genuinely cared about growing the sport. Like he wasn't just, you know, like our former CEO who kind of gave the impression that he just wanted to be here and kind of like a businessman, old boy kind of stuff. And you know, he he really wants to grow it. He he worked a lot through the grassroots, so we love that about him. And you know, seeing him move up into this position doesn't give me the impression that he's going to move to this position and you know. Um, have a high-ranking role in, in world rugby and kind of take it as that. I think he's going to really get involved and really help out, even akin to what Augustin Pichot did that in South America. Um, he helped a lot, really bringing in a lot of initiatives to create more rugby opportunities in South America, um, as we saw a lot with the uh, the Sud America uh, championships. And, and even with the ARC, I think he played a, a big role in parts of that at least. Um, so I think that having Dan Payne involved is just nothing but good news for even North and South America, really. Definitely. I, so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's like they recognize talent that can be very influential and they want to groom it to, you know, lead this, hem- the development of our hemisphere. And for us as USA rugby, that like Liam said, we get a great ally, uh, in charge, you know. So, uh, moving on to views, quick, news, and abuse. Give me, give me a second, Aaron, real quick. And just because I'm a stickler about geography, just to let you know, uh, Rugby Americas is about the continent of the Americas, not the hemisphere. Thank you no, very much. Rugby Car- Americas. Rugby North. Americas is for both RAN and mm-hmm. Sud America, yeah, so which is the, the content of. The continent of the continent, uh, the hemisphere, hemisphere, the entire, hemisphere, yeah, the entire hemisphere. hemisphere. No, the that's Americans not a hemisphere. has their own hemisphere. <laughs> I didn't know the, we had our own hemisphere. The Western, the Western hemisphere. Ah, get God. with it. The continent, oh. the continent of the America. Oh, Wait, isn't America. it North and South, Southern hemisphere? Well, the Americas. There's North, South, East, and West. Get out. Whatever. Just pan them where they're connecting the two. Look, look, right, I'm, I'm going to go get my globe, globe and we're going to settle this right now. <laughs> so, so, okay. Listen, the, 1800s. The, sub, the sub-hemisphere <laughs> the sub-hemispherical <laughs> continents of North and South America. Yes. Okay. That's what he's yes. in charge of. Guys, I've, got it, I've got it figured right, out. Moving, moving he's on. in charge of everything that matters. Coming on Wednesday. He's in charge of everything that matters. And the rest of the world, we don't care about. <laughs> exactly. Listen, Which is just listen, listen. North America. This, uh, American right. exceptionalism. This has, been around, this has been around for a couple hundred years. 1823, Monroe Doctrine. The U.S. controls everything in the Western <laughs> Hemisphere. Everyone else, stay the hell out. Um, so that's <laughs> James We're Monroe. getting Great. academic in this bitch Great right president. Now. See, I'm Hispanic, so I can vouch for that as true. Mm-hmm. So I'm moving on to, to I'm American. I can vouch for that too. and abuse. <laughs> Uh, this one, um, this is sort of solemn news. Uh, the uh, North Cal- Northern California Rugby Football Union suffered a tragedy. Uh, Scott Wood uh, passed away from a heart attack in his car following a high school game that he refed. Uh, our condolences to his family and loved ones. Uh, check out on our Twitter feed the uh, GoFundMe link for his family to help fund the cost of his funeral. Uh this was kind of cool. Uh, New York was hanging out at the Fanatics HQ today. Uh, so uh, 
we'll see if they become an official partner with MLR. Uh, you don't know what Fanatics is. They're an official partner uh, with all sorts of merchandise for every major sports league in America. Mm-hmm. Including NASCAR. Yeah. Exactly. They're all, uh, all retailer, by the way. Like literally every major sports league in America. Mm-hmm. So, That's right. Uh, I guess some abuse the we took on the sub was the lack of TMO. Uh, from what I understand, that will at least be in place for the semifinals and finals. But I think it it would help to have next week. <laughs> uh, and then MLR news coverage, uh, CBS and CBS Sports Networks. Twitter feed was all MLR during the broadcast window. Really cool. Top 14 tweeted about Major League Rugby, and there was an article in The Guardian covering New Orleans versus Houston. So that was that was cool. That was not written by a friend of the show, Martin Pengeli. I'm so quite surprised. Yeah, well, some other people are out there too, right? It, it was someone else. Was it him? Yeah. Moving yeah. to uh, final thoughts, Corey has something to say. Yeah, well, real quick, normally this is about the time we do questions from Bob, uh, but obviously first week we're running a little bit over on our time. So we've go, gone ahead and saved those questions, and uh, we'll get to as many of them uh, next week as we can. Otherwise, just look for us on uh, the sub over on uh, RML Rugby or on Twitter, and we'll address uh, what we can there. So uh, real quick with final thoughts, I just had something I wanted to kind of – uh, talk a little bit about, and I was tweeting about this uh, briefly this week and got a little bit of love, got a little bit of few jeers, few cheers. Um, and you guys hit on it earlier. So this is basically talking about the value or lack thereof of tradition uh, as rugby moves into the U.S. market. Obviously, rugby comes with a lot of expectations, uh, especially from overseas fans. Uh, the, that was most noticeable in people getting really frustrated with uh, the breaks that were taken at about the 20-minute mark in all the matches this weekend. So they called them water breaks. Uh, realistically, I have a feeling they're uh, kind of just a spot. Their quarters. That they're, yeah, they're, okay, they're so, so a spot. it wasn't even at the quarter, though. Like the first – it was at weird intervals, which is probably – I don't know. Maybe they're being, maybe the refs are being told to liberally hydrate or something, but law 5.9 allows for the ref to call for a water break. However, um, the one game that I don't think there should have been water breaks at was uh, Seattle versus San Diego because the conditions were perfect. Whereas it was freezing in Colorado and it was humid as fuck in Houston this weekend. So, those would be the two places that you could seek hydration because you're not losing as much fluid or so, you're losing a lot more fluids. So my point being, I think they're kind of a holding spot for what could eventually be called a commercial break on the quarters. And a lot of people were accusing MLR of this. Um, and frankly, I'm fine if they want to do that. And I'll tell you why. We... We run off of advertisers. We run. We the league has to make money. That the networks have to make money to continue to uh, cover this sport and continue to push it out to millions of subscribers across the country. And if we have to take a one minute or two minute break halfway through each half to accomplish that, so that we can have this coverage across the entire country, I am fine with it. And well, I don't think it. I don't I, think it diminishes. I don't think it diminishes the game. I don't think it diminishes the talent of the people playing. And I don't think it really is going to hurt them that one or two minutes that they take a drink of water uh, when it comes to world rugby competition. I think taking in fluids will like actually helps performance. Period. Uh, but really? as, wow, uh, wow, you, it's like oh my gosh, uh, you know, making sure you're fully hydrated is actually going to help. Like, take away from performance, apparently. No, it's not. It's going to help performance. But there are, I think there are periods in the game that they can run commercials. And I think uh, as the demand grows, we'll probably see that go away because we'll have the type of advertisers that want to project onto the pitch, you know, the major companies. Because if you notice, there really wasn't 
sponsorship activation on the pitch. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing with um with the water breaks, I I mean I prefer them not to be there as long as they don't they weren't egregious and also they didn't make a strict hard stop where you know if, if the game is still being played they're not going to find a way to stop the game just so they can get commercial. I know something similar to that happens in football where they have commercial timeouts. But in in this, like if it was 18 minutes and 30 seconds and the other team just scored a try, then they'll cut to commercial. And it was a really quick commercial too. So it's it's really, it's not really a, a big loss because they didn't really extend that much. You know, maybe an extra 30, 40 seconds more. But it's either, you know, get the commercial or watch them standing around for almost that much time. So I, I didn't have a big issue with it, like like what Corey's saying. Um, well, the, the timing is also in the law that it requires either after a score or a dead ball. Yeah, obviously it's going to be a dead ball. If they're going to blow the whistle mid-run, that will be riots. So. I also agree with Corey. I think that was actually a great idea of implementing a commercial breaks with the water break because as sports in the U.S. are – there's a lot of commercials, unfortunately, I'm, but again, you want to get that revenue. I mean, I don't want rugby to I, become. I'm surprised. Ads, I mean, but again, you have, want them at least during the water breaks and during halftime, probably. Go ahead. Aaron. I'm surprised that in the UK, when we're watching like the Premiership or Super Rugby, that when they do have those injury timeouts or they actually do have those water breaks, because guess what? What is it? Last week in the Waratahs? Uh, you know, use 5.9 because it was like 30, 30 Celsius and 80% humidity or something. They also did water breaks. I'm surprised during breaks in play, all these other games don't have commercials because apparently the TV revenue runs super rugby. You know, the other thing too is, is when you're in Houston in June, when the season's going to be at its peak, it's a lot hotter than uh england in like february or march so it's it's a big difference in where you're playing where at that point you actually want them to to make sure they have you know water there well i just like to bring up i went to bro the denver the denver ohio match the second one um in pro rugby it was 106 degrees here in denver jeez yeah. That's water break material. Yeah. But you say so. every 10 minutes. Let's go. <laughs> but um I think the last one, what was your last thought? Oh, I think that's about it for me. I was going to make a comment about the uh, crowd noise issue, but I think we kind of hit on that earlier, so. It was it was dope AF. I'm good with it. I think it's very American. Well, I, I think it goes back to the lines of us call of us calling it major league rugby whereas okay there's other leagues that do it too yeah so you can't just blame it on us being america yeah, the other okay. thing too is that is people were saying in response to the, the the whole respecting the kicker thing is that people think this is a whole rugby wide tradition but it's as far as I'm concerned, it's actually not it's it's um there are certain places where they do it but i'm pretty sure like in france they will boo the hell out of the kicker and even yeah, parts of England right. too and you're right. Is, is, is that see? Is, is that Latin thing? Because that it's, happens it's, also in Spain. It's culture, like it's team. I would say let culture be derived, like driven by fans, venue to venue. And the thing, and also with this too, is that we have. I mean, we have some sports like American football, for instance. And I've probably said football like thirty times in this podcast. I don't know why I brought it up so much, but we have sports that are originally from, or at least that that the U.S. really is I guess the tier one country for like football or basketball. And then they go to other countries. Um, all the, the traditions are going to change. The fans are different. And I'm not going to sit here and, and complain because um, the fans over in England aren't tailgating properly before they go to Wembley stadium or something. Hey, like they that. definitely uh, don't tailgate properly. They need to <laughs> no. understand that barbecues need to occur. <laughs> you know what? Speaking real quick, uh, speaking of sports cultures, uh, to Dan's point, just look at baseball. Baseball in the U.S. is very different from baseball down in the Dominican Republic or down in Japan. Those are co- completely different cultures. Oh, Japan down in baseball the, is 
Exactly. <laughs> yes, and then you got the little baggy things at the wag, and also when they're about to pitch, everyone's silent. Oh my God, back home in DR, we have this guy, these guys usually with drums, and this thing that we have called the Wida, which is this thing made out of metal, and you have this thing that looks like a fork that you, that you, that you like scratch, it has like this chucky sound yeah so i mean you have these you know guys playing merengue and some lawas bachata music in the back as a guy is like rather about to hit the ball so again same sport three completely different cultures yeah, yeah and uh, I, honestly i don't think the u.s should have any kind of obligation to change the way our sports fans behave you know uh well it's, let's, it's, let's it's, not be like dodger fans and no assault and batter people in the parking lot or yeah. Philadelphia fans, or you know, Baltimore Ravens fans, you know. Boston fans, or you know. no, hey, no, listen, we will talk <laughs> our trash, but we will not assault anybody, all right, occasionally by choice. Yeah, at least, by, at least by we're not Philly really throwing snowballs. Well, at well yeah. your players will. Who, who in our players is assaulting anybody? Uh, don't, don't don't even say Hernandez. Do not even say <laughs> Hernandez. What was that about Hernandez? What was that about Hernandez? What? <laughs> All right, let's get out of here, Victor. Take us home. Awesome. Yeah, sorry guys. I just heard Hernandez, and I, and I assume to talk about one of my yeah. one of my cousins. Like, yo, Hernandez, what the hell are you talking about? Oi, cuidado, now, pero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah, if you guys don't know, guys, um, Leon speaks um, a super accented Spanish, but at least he speaks it <laughs> way better than Aaron. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> That's the guy that speaking boca, Victor. <laughs> That's the guy that should speak Spanish and he doesn't. Yeah. Rapidamente. Rapidamente. Oh, dude, that was nice. Rapidamente. Okay, no, but seriously, guys. So, first of all, guys, thank you all for joining us. Episode 33 of the Earful of Dirt Major League Rugby podcast. Uh, so, super happy that we got to talk finally about the league from round one, and we're going to be doing this onward. I guess we still don't have plans of what we're going to do after the season is over, but still far away. The guys and I will talk about it. So what we're going um, to do. Well, hey. Dan, Dan and I are going to Rugby World Cup 7s, but we're going to take a break after the season's over. Oh, I'm not going to the 7s. I'm sorry. You sold your tickets? No, I didn't get tickets. Ew. We're going to Colombia for the uh, Central American Caribbean Games, where rugby is being played. So yes, that's right. That's actually going to be pretty exciting too. That is exactly right. Yeah, and Bolivia is actually going to be performing in rugby for the first time. Uh, Bolivia is actually the only, the last team in the Americas not to have a rugby team, and now they do. Wow. So in fact, yeah, there you go. So you're going to watch Bolivia get their butt kicked by everyone else, and have Can't fun. Wait. That's why yeah, I'm going. Seriously. Yeah. You know, they're going to be probably chewing on, on, some, on, on some coca leaves, you know, yeah. to get probably some, yeah, hopefully. I don't think people nah, care nah. too much about South American rugby, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, go on to the next part. I just realized we've been on here for an hour and 45 minutes. Yeah, seriously. So, in any case, guys, um, YouTube. Uh, youtube.com slash you're full of dirt uh, look for us there so you could get the the live streams uh, that we do like for example this one if you're listening to it on podcast form um keep in mind we do this at 10 p.m eastern 7 p.m pacific time uh, when it comes to social media facebook instagram Twitter, all of them at Earful of Dirt. Make sure to follow us on all of them. When it comes to the podcast form, if you're listening on the podcast form, thank you. Hopefully, you are already subscribed to us, whether it's on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Player FM, ACAS. And make sure to leave us a review. Thanks again uh, to Rugby Nation USA for the review. We hope to get another one next week as well for you. And also, guys, make sure to call us on our phone number. Drop us a voicemail. We haven't checked that. I don't think at least. But in any case, the number is 720-600-2679. Again, that's 720-600-2679. Also, before I forget, a shout outs to fellow Domin Dominican Rafael Delgadillo, who told me to send him a shout out. Almost forgot. Uh, the biggest fan of Nola. He was super happy with Nola beat Houston. So there you go, Rafael. I got you, hermano. See, I told you. I, I got your saludo. Well, also, guys, um, make sure, uh, speaking of following people, make sure to follow uh, Mr. Liam Poach, Liam Madigan, uh, at uh, Penguin uh, Tantra. Make sure to check out his blog. Some really good opinions. Uh, well, with Thank all you. that, uh, you're welcome, bro. Hey, anytime. Thank you for coming. I uh, can't, for, can't forget, can't forget to mention it. that. Absolutely loved it. Awesome. It was a pleasure having you. 
Well, guys, uh, so again, that will be the end of the show. So once again, my name is Victor. Once again, that was Liam Madigan. That was, again, Aaron Castro, Josh Freglum, uh, Corey Munson, and Dan Brown, not the guy from the book. Before anyone says, I'm going to retire that. And we'll see you guys next week for round two of my early rugby. <laughs> Cut.